How long does it take to really build a new habit? To talk about it today, our own Emily Medill is back to discuss creating new habits. She joins us live today on WNDB's Mark Bernier program. So how long does it take you to develop a new habit? Hi, Mark. Hi, um, that's a good question. Uh, I would say it takes me a little while. Really? Sure. Really? Yeah. Yeah, really. When you became the exercise queen that you have become, you did that rather quickly, I thought. No? No, I mean, no. It's something, being active has been a part of my life for a long time. Okay. I can't even really remember back when I first implemented it, but, um, yeah, it's just something that kind of gradually occurred over time, I would say. Tell us about Philippa Lally. She's a health psychology researcher at the uh, University College in London. You had... Um, you, this was part of uh, the, the study on how to build a new habit? Yeah, well, it was interesting. I When I was researching ideas for our discussion today, I, I came up with something on the Huffington Post, and um, there was a study done in London that says that the 21 days um, that hype that everybody believes it takes to form a new habit is actually not accurate. It was based on a 1960s um, study, a quote actually that was published by a doctor who, he was a plastic surgeon actually, and so what he found in his studies was that um, it took about 21 days for people after they had a surgery to um, for their old mental image to dissolve and to gel into a new one. And so he had published this idea that, um, you know, it takes up to, or, you know, at least 21 days. But w what's happened is, you know, what they say in the Huffington Post was that, you know, the self-health self-help kind of craze, um, a lot of people have taken that as gospel, that it takes 21 days to form a new habit. And so this study in London, you know, they, they did quite a study on it, and they found that it takes 66 days to be exact. And with that being said, um, you know, it could take anywhere from two months to eight months to build a new behavior into your life that becomes a habit, that becomes like second nature. Yeah, and there's one that shows up in your notes that some people choose simple habits like drinking a bottle of water with lunch. Is that, if would somebody be doing that to uh, curb their appetite or to consume less food so they do that or to wean themselves off a sugary drink that they would drink with their meal? I'm just curious about that. Yeah, I think all of the above, and I think, you know, people kind of chose it in this study just to kind of see how long it takes for something second nature. You don't have to think about it anymore. It's just something that you do. Give an example of things that, even in your own personal life, that are habits that are second nature that you don't think about. Exercise, for sure, is something that I don't think about. It's a part of my day. Um, like, I think... You know, we have small kids, and as a family, like, bedtime routines is, you know, a part of it. And, you know, brushing our teeth and all those things, and my kids will just automatically do those things now. Like, they're, it's become a habit, right? It's just yeah. something that's second nature. In the case that you're mentioning with children, how long did it take before that regiment became routine? Was it weeks? Did you, did you sense that it followed this uh, 66 days, or was it much faster for them? No, I would say it was definitely gradual. I mean, a bedtime routine is something we started when they were babies, so that's kind of really, you know, hard to calculate, but it's just something that we implemented. And, I mean, we're pretty structured people, so, um, you know, that kind of works really well for us. But I, I just think this, this research is really interesting, Mark, because I think a lot of people get frustrated. You know, they try something for a few weeks, and if it hasn't completely gelled or become a part of their life or it's still difficult, it's kind of like, well, I guess I'm a failure or I guess this isn't for me. And I think people have a tendency sometimes to give up too soon and or, you know, to get let down by, um, you know, the little kind of 
like messing up along the way, right? Instead of just kind of restarting, I think people give up too soon. And so this research I find interesting because it's kind of sending the message, just, you know, stick with something um, if it's important to you and eventually it will become second nature. How much of it, Emily, is often, I know Americans pile on, I don't know how Canadians do it, but if they take on too many things in trying to either develop a habit or break a habit, that leads to the frustration. Do you think it's because we try to do too many things at once that people fail? So. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, you got to prioritize and kind of, um, you know, implement the things that are most important to you. And, you know, maybe time management is something that becomes like a habit. Like I know in my coaching practice right now and the people that I'm coaching and, and that mm -hmm. are coaching me, that's kind of a big theme that comes up is, you know, how do we create more kind of space just to be and to focus and prioritize. And so, you know, each week we're taking those things and kind of working on it. And so, and it, it is becoming easier as yeah. the time goes by. Yeah. Well, I'll bear my own soul and, and explain to the audience that I've had to make changes in my life. One of them is this insane amount of sugar I was consuming. I would put in, and I will admit it here, four packs of sugar in a cup of coffee. I did that for years, and I, I, I hated myself for doing it, but it was a habit. I just would grab four packages all the time. I weaned myself down to two, and now I'm about to wean myself down to one, because if I did it any other way, I would have got frustrated and never made that change. The other thing was curbing the amount of coffee I was drinking. At one point, I was drinking seven cups a day. I'm now down to a maximum of four, most often three. And that has taken me an average, I think, to make any of these changes before I felt it took. It was, for me, two months, which would be within the ballpark of your 66-day study. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that, I mean, what you said there, too, is to make, you know, small steps, too, right? Like, I think when people, <laughs> there is that, like, we want instant gratification, and it's like an all or nothing right now, or forget it, it's just not for me, right? Yes. And so I think that was smart that you, you know, gradually weaned yourself off. And so if we can gradually implement these new habits into our lives and just take small steps, I believe and you know it's happened in my own life that it, it is more likely to stick do you, th do you think that it's naturally harder to give up a bad habit than it is to develop a new good habit mm, I mean my own personal opinion I don't think so but I mean there might be research around that I know people you know that are quitting smoking and things like that like maybe there are things that are um, have a physical component that would definitely make it way more difficult to, you know, take yourself off of, whereas if you're implementing something new, you're not necessarily having to, you know, take away a physical side effect. But my own personal opinion around it is it's, it is kind of like a mindset, and if you're, I believe that if you're open and you're ready and willing to, to take something on or to develop yourself further in an area, that um, it can be done. Emily, can it also approach a gray area where one may have an addiction to something? It could be a very benign type of addiction, but they have an addiction. So it goes from habit to forced behavior for whatever reason. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, and uh, yeah, I definitely think, you know, there is a total gray area. And I mean, that's not really what we're discussing here today because, yeah, there definitely is a whole other component to it. And this is more just, you know, when people want to, you know, develop a new habit for themselves that, you know, makes it kind of easier in their life, right? Because when we have something that's a habit, um, you know, studies have shown too in our brains, um, we're the brain that operates in, you know, your habit center is the part of your brain that also controls like your breathing and swallowing and things that yeah. you do subconsciously, right? So yeah. if we implement something like drinking more water or like you down to two things of sugar in your coffee it's just an automatic kind of thing and it's not like this totally hyper focused thing right because if you're using the area of your brain that's really conscious um 
uh, your prefrontal cortex, it's you know, really quite taxing on your system. And so that's kind of like your willpower, right? Yes. And so if you're trying to just simply operate on that all the time, like it, it just, there's different external kind of factors that would come into play, um, you know, that would make it harder to just purely operate on willpower all the time. I read something in chiropractor Dr. Linda Lombardo's office one day about breathing, and I, I, I found it astonishing, but I can understand it. The people forget to breathe. I think you and I actually spoke about this on an occasion, that if you're going through a stressful time, you almost have to consciously tell yourself to breathe through it. And after a while, I guess you could develop the habit of breathing through stressful situations. Do you use that yourself in your stressful situations, try to breathe through it? Yeah, definitely. Like it's just a part of kind of mindfulness and it's definitely a tool for me. And, you know, I even have things in my office, you know, um, that say breathe, you know, just reminders um, as a part of kind of making that habit, right? Or, or taking part in yoga or when I'm exercising, you know, really focusing on my breath. Obviously, Mark, that's not something I do all day, but um, yeah, I think... You know, once you kind of create that awareness and if you want to get yourself out of a stressful situation, um, breath is an extremely powerful way to do that. And that's something that you could form a habit. I know last time we talked, you had mentioned about um, over the last couple of months just practicing, like, making your voice a bit quieter in stressful situations and how now that's kind of becoming second nature and how powerful that is, right? So it's just, I don't know. I, I just think it's its a powerful way to um, cope with stress and to create more opportunities for happiness in our lives. Still under the umbrella of creating new habits, on August 11th, you wrote... Uh, a piece called Change. The secret of change is to focus all of our energy not on fighting the old, but on building the new. A quote from Socrates. You wrote that in August of last year. What point were you trying to, the greater point you were trying to make in this piece? Well, you know, I think that when we view change as a catalyst for new, exciting opportunities, we can move our energy from, you know, fighting change um, to embracing it. And, you know, things become a bit more fluid and inspiring when we're not, when we're not trying to um, resist the change. Most people do not want to change when it's something negative unless you're holding a, forgive the expression, a gun to their head. Uh, not being a gun person, I, I don't want to offend you with that, but... Let me just say that a lot of people don't do it until their back is to the wall on this. Are you ever like that? Yeah, I think we're all like that. We're human beings and, you know, change isn't easy. Um, so, again, like I think you kind of have to be open and willing to want to create something different in your life in order for change to take place. Um, I, I have been guilty in my life of not looking long range at the big picture. I, I do it, but I don't always do it. If a person consciously trains themselves so that it becomes second nature to look at the big picture, does that help a person to acquire new and better habits faster? I mean, I have certainly come across that a lot lately, Mark, just in neuroscience and different things, and it, it makes a lot of sense. Like when we focus on, like if we're open and willing and ready for the change, we know what that is, we know what the big vision is. If we can visualize ourselves for a moment in, in that place, it actually becomes easier to imagine yourself there, right? And you're actually creating new neural pathways and new ways of scanning your world to to kind of start collecting evidence and making the steps towards making that change. Like it actually can be a really um, powerful way to become unstuck and to um, kind of give yourself that hope that it is possible. And um, it is really powerful to do that. Like I've done that in my life with a lot of different things. And um, it doesn't mean that you can just sit down and imagine things and they're gonna fall in your lap. It's the very opposite of that. You still have to make those steps 
I think that making that connection, though, makes it easier to make that first initial step. Emily Medill, author and coach in the area of empowerment, our guest today on WNDB. As always, Miss Emily, a slice of heaven. And you... oh, thanks, Mark. <laughs> Have a great day. You too. Bye, Emily. Bye.